arriving back home uh, from NASA from work for the day and I'm walking through my garage and holy smokes here is this big red shipping container with white letters on the side of it that says Eagles. Joe Walsh had sent me a Roland Stereo Chorus amplifier and uh, probably even more valuable than that a shipping container that says Eagles on it and it was a it was a gift from Joe Walsh of the Eagles. You have led I don't want to say a charmed existence because it sounds like you didn't have anything to do with it but that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> My wife uses that expression all the time. I have lived a, I guess I'd say I've lived a very charmed life. I've been so, so very lucky. Uh, for example, if we're going to a busy restaurant and we show up in the parking lot, there will be a parking space right up front. And I say, oh, wow, look at this. Here's our parking space. And she says the words, charmed life in everything. <laughs> and, and you, of course, smile broadly and say, well, look who I married, right? That's part of your charmed well, life. Well, yes, and I, I have a hard time. You can use that if you want. I have a hard time <laughs> believing she picked me uh, because she's gorgeous. She's beautiful. She's always been beautiful. She was one of the first six American women astronauts. And... We met in the space program, and I remember the first time I ever met her being rather charmed by her. Dr. Ray Seddon, of course, was an astronaut, and, and how many missions did, did Ray have? She flew three missions. She flew her first flight aboard Columbia, and uh, it, was a, it was a fairly long, well, let's see, it was an eight-day mission. Her first one was just an eight-day mission, but then she flew two more missions. So she flew once prior to Challenger, and then she was one of the ones that was brave enough to fly again after Challenger, and she made two more missions after Challenger. She made, she made two relatively long missions after Challenger. She did space lab flights, which were scientific investigations, where they carried the Space Lab Laboratory back in the cargo bay, instead of carrying satellites and things, they had a laboratory back there and it filled up, basically filled up the cargo bay. And it doubled the amount of livable pressurized volume that we had aboard the shuttle. The, the space shuttle had 2,500 cubic feet in the cabin, the upper deck and the lower deck. And the Space Lab Laboratory added another 2,500 cubic feet. And so it gave us 5,000 cubic feet to work in. So she had, in just three missions, she had 30 days in space. And when she was in space on her final mission, we, meaning me and the kids, would all go down to the Cape to watch her launch. And then we came back to Houston because I'd go back to work for the two weeks while she was in space. And at the time, I was the chief astronaut. And I'll never forget, I'm driving to work one morning in my car, and I had the radio on, and the announcer comes up and says, hey, here's something interesting. As of this morning, Dr. Ray Seddon, who's in space aboard the space shuttle Columbia, has more time in space than her husband, the chief astronaut, Hoot Gibson. And I remember my first thought was, Hey, this isn't news. This is drivel. Why are you? Well, anyway, it was an interesting statistic because at the time that I was chief astronaut, I had only flown four times. So I had 26 and a half days in space. She now had 30 days in space that morning. So she had more time in space than I did. But it made a, it made a funny story. So I wound up flying a fifth time after that. And so then... Only then was I able to surpass her and wind up with 36 and a half days in space. <laughs> you, do, you do have a charmed existence. Um, years ago, and I mean maybe 30 years ago, I remember uh, making a trip down, down to NASA and seeing the simulator, the, pretty much the full-size shuttle, and uh, had a chance to talk to, to Ray then. And uh, at that time, people were starting to talk about Mars. And 
it just, when she started to delineate the challenges to the human body of being weightless that long and then encountering whatever gravity is on Mars and then Earth's gravity upon return, um, I almost came away feeling we, we're never going to go to Mars because we don't know if the body can stand it. It was it was a fascinating interview, and I hope we get we can get her. Does she come into the hangar? It isn't just a man the right? She she does come into the hangar. Yes, yeah, that's that's good to know. Yes, that's good to know. Yes, Ray came in as a medical doctor. Uh, she was a general surgeon. In fact, she was the most advanced medical doctor that we had ever picked to be an astronaut. Three, two, one. We have ever been. What a fascinating thing to be in the first group of women to come into the astronaut program. How do women's bodies differ from men's when you put them in this strange environment? How are women going to be able to fit into this program that's been all men up to this point? I've met a number of the women who put themselves through the same physical exams as the original Mercury astronauts did. They passed the physical exams. But NASA said, you just don't have the credentials that we're requiring. And those women, had they been born 20 years later, would have been astronauts, some of them. But they were just too early. I was just at the right place at the right time. She had completed a, a general surgery residency and was about to start a residency in plastic surgery when NASA picked her. And so she came to NASA as a very experienced doctor. And she was very fascinated by and interested in all of the human aspects of going to space. So as you mentioned, uh, back that would have been about 1992 that she would have brought up the fact that we're not sure if we can send humans to Mars because you've got to be weightless for about eight months on your way to Mars. It could conceivably be as long as eight months, depending on where Mars is with respect to Earth. And then, all of your time on Mars, you're going to be at one-third gravity. One-third of Earth's gravity is what you'll see on Mars. And then coming back, it could conceivably be another eight months. And so, what are, what are the effects? We have, we have seen, and she'll be, she'll be much better to talk about this, but we've seen calcium loss out of the bones, uh, which resembles osteoporosis. And so NASA has been studying that because if we can figure out how to prevent that, we can save women from experiencing osteoporosis as they get older. So Ray has always been very interested in the life sciences investigations that are done on board the space shuttle. Most of the astronauts tried to avoid those like the plague because that involved blood draws and uncomfortable <laughs> and unpleasant things. She was one of the few that said, I want to be part of this investigation. So she's, she's been a real valuable astronaut to NASA because she, she welcomed all of that. And so she wound up flying. Her second mission was Space and Life Sciences 1 is what the mission was called. And then her final mission, she flew as the payload commander for Space and Life Sciences too. Welcome to Hoot Gibson's Hangar, and we have a very special guest joining us today, astronaut Ray Seddon, and also my wife. Well, welcome to Hoot Gibson's Hangar. Thank you so much, Hoot. It's a delight to be here. Well, we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, some of our mutual experiences over the years. And to start off, though, we don't need to hear me talk. Why don't you tell us about, tell us about how you got to NASA? Well, you know, I think my earliest remembrance <clears throat> about the space program was standing out in my backyard, a little town here in Tennessee, and my father took me out there and said, look up. And there was a little light blinking across the sky, and he said, that's something called a satellite, and you're seeing the beginning of the space age. 
And that, to a little 10-year-old girl, was, you know, kind of like, this is the beginning of something important. And that's one of my earliest remembrances of space. And, you know, that interest in knowing more about that followed me for a very long time. I just hoped that I would <clears throat> be able to fly in space someday. But, you know, at the time, they were only taking male test pilots. And you had to be between 5, 6, and 5, 10 inches tall. Well, I was little. I was like 5 feet tall. So that was not a very um, good thing to be dreaming about doing when I was a little girl. Um, and so I had to sort of decide what else I wanted to do. And when I was a sophomore in high school, I took biology and I really liked that. So the life sciences became what I thought that I could do and make into a career someday. Okay, and so then you did that? Where I did. You, where did you go from there? Um. I went from a um, little town in Tennessee where I knew everybody at my high school, and I decided that I wanted to go to the best school in the country, the best university in the life sciences. And believe it or not, I ended up going from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, to the University of California at Berkeley in the late 60s. And that was a crazy place back then with the free speech movement and women's lib and anti-war protests and stuff like that. So um, it was pretty insane. There were times when I thought, I don't really belong here. But they had a really good program in the life sciences and... Um, so I made my way through that. Uh, I was pre-med and applied to medical school, was lucky enough to get in to the University of Tennessee uh, College of Medicine in Memphis. So after medical school, I decided that I really liked surgery. Um, I'd been sewing doll clothes for a long time, and I figured that I had some skills that perhaps would help me in sewing up people. So that's what I ended up doing, you know, for a residency program. And at the end of that, I found out that NASA was going to take females into the astronaut program. And so that's how I ended up applying and getting into NASA. And that's how I met you. Oh, that's right. Of course. Okay, so, um, so you got your your MD degree and did a residency in general surgery, as I recall. Yes. And and you had completed that, and you were going to go into uh, plastic surgery at that point. From there. Yes, probably plastic surgery or maybe emergency room work, but. I really liked the plastic surgery part of it. I figured that um, women would appreciate having a female plastic surgeon because um, women would say, well, you know, she's a female. She knows what I want to look like and what I don't want to look like. So that's how I got interested in that. Okay. And then, um, so then at some point you applied uh, to NASA. What, talk, talk about that and talk about the, the selection process and... How how strong do you think your chances were and all of that sort of thing? Right. Well, NASA um, was going to take females into the 1978 class of astronauts. And um, it was, you know, kind of unusual for women to want to go into that program. Um, but there were quite a few women who applied, many more men that applied, I think there were like 8,500 people that applied for that astronaut class because it had been the first time um, that they had selected astronauts in quite a few years. And uh, it was just kind of remarkable that they were going to allow women and non-pilots to apply. And um, I didn't really think I had a chance to get in, but I did have some good background. I had my medical degree and my residency and... I had actually taken flying lessons, so I had my pilot's license when I applied. So there were an awful lot of females, not an awful lot of females, but quite a number of females who had advanced degrees, MDs or PhDs, 
but very few of them had a pilot's license. So it's kind of a good idea that I had that credential that was a little bit unexpected when I applied. But still, I figured I didn't really have much of a chance to get in. Do you feel that the uh, pilot's license might have been a factor in your selection, may have helped that some? I think so. I think in looking back, NASA appreciated when the applicants were not just people that lived in an ivory tower, um, that they had done some risk-taking, and then certainly, um, you know, flying in an airplane has some risk associated with it. And um, so I think that was a real advantage to me um, to be able to say, oh, yes, I have my private pilot's license. But again, um, you know, you can wish and hope that all the things you've done were correct, but you had to kind of guess along the way. I can remember when I was selected, they took me out and sit, sat me in a T-38 jet, and they said, how would you fly, like to fly this thing? And I'm going, oh, that would be wonderful. I had no idea what that was going to be like. So how much supersonic jet time do you have? You flew the T-38 for, what, 18 years? You flew the T-38s for 18 years. Probably 1,500 hours of jet time. I'd have to look it up. Okay, well, um, talk about that. What was the the program in that? Did uh, NASA send you through Air Force pilot training to learn how to fly the T-38? How did you you check out and qualify in in the T-38s? Well, you know, when we got to NASA, NASA decided that we didn't need to go through um, all the Air Force training to be able to fly in the T-38s. They felt like that would take an awfully long time, and they might lose some people along the way who didn't do well. Um, So they put us in the back seat of T-38s, and we always had a, a pilot up front. Um, but the backseaters had to take care of the communication and the navigation. The pilots let us fly it as much as we could or wanted to. So I was lucky that I had some really good teachers to fly in the jets. And I got pretty good at it. I could uh, um, take it right after liftoff and I could fly the airplane all the way to some other city and get it right down to the minimum Uh, allowable altitude uh, before landing and the pilot would take over from there but it was a it was an awful lot of fun it was a challenge at first Um, but over time I mean all the pilots were good at showing us how to do this and um, you know I I think I was doing pretty well at it got quite a few hours was it anything like your Cessnas that you flew? Uh, how would you describe the uh, the handling of the T-38 and the, the performance of it? Was it uh, Would it climb like a Cessna 150? <laughs> no. You know, uh, Cessna 150 was kind of like a little putt-putt airplane compared to the T-38 jets. Um, that, uh, you know, everything happened quickly. You were certainly going to a different altitude than you ever than you ever would in a Cessna 150. Um, looking at the ground was wonderful, uh, good scenery to see. Um, had to learn about not flying into bad weather and things like that, um, and learning, you know, how to um, fly the airplane without looking at the instruments, uh, using visual cues and. I learned a lot um, from doing that, but it was, a, it was a totally different sort of thing. But I realized that I needed to learn a lot about flying if I ever hoped to fly on the space shuttle. Did you ever have um, a gifted pilot that, that, uh, that gave you a challenge and, and to, to measure you know, what you're worth and to measure how good you are by playing dead pilot? Yes, the remarkable Hoot Gibson (laughs) was always challenging me to be able to do things that I was a little scared of doing. Um, One of them was that we would take off and he would say, dead pilot. 
And um, so that meant I had to handle the communication, the navigation, uh, and everything. And frequently, you wouldn't take the plane over until we were fairly close to the ground, which was a little bit scary. But um, the backseaters were not allowed to land the airplane, so I had to watch the altitude and let you take that over <laughs> to do the landing part. Well, the, uh, this supersonic jet must must have been fairly easy to fly, wasn't it? I mean, it must have had a pretty good autopilot, right? There was no autopilot in the T-38. <laughs> I was the autopilot. So um, you would be flying the airplane by hand. Absolutely. At 39 and 41,000 feet right. at point nine Mach number, nine tenths the speed of sound, right? Exactly. And so that took quite a bit of technique, I'd say. It did. And do you think, you never had to do it, fortunately, because you never did have a dead pilot. You just had, you just had one who was almost a dead pilot for making you do it. <laughs> yes. But uh, do you think you could have landed the airplane yourself if you had had to do it? Probably. It wouldn't have been a pretty landing, might have bounced a little bit, but, you know, I had the skills, I knew what I was supposed to be doing, um, but it's difficult to land the T-38 uh, from the back seat. So um, I'm glad I never had to do it, but, you know, certainly um, if it was that or crashing or something, I probably could have done it. Well, having flown with you a great many times, I think you would have been able to do it as well. That was my assessment, and, uh, and, and you passed the test, uh, not without some verbal uh, commentary Whining. to me about it. <laughs> uh, as I recall it, you weren't terribly pleased when I made you play dead pilot. Exactly. You weren't exactly pleased with me, but uh, you flew the airplane all by yourself, all the way from Houston, Texas, to El Paso, Texas, over the course of about an hour and a half, and up to 39 or, yeah, it would have been 39,000 feet going right. that direction, right. and flew the whole descent into mm -hmm. there, and then down to about 500 feet when I took it over, mm -hmm. and uh, I think I had to sleep out in the garage that night. Uh, <laughs> because uh, you weren't you weren't too pleased that I that I put you through All that right. ringer like that but you you passed the test okay so that was that was uh, I'd say the t38s must have been a lot of fun they were I mean you know once you relaxed in them and um, knew that you could handle the problems and stuff we didn't have an awful lot of, of problems in the airplane did we I mean there we were the uh, the folks that took care of those airplanes worked really hard because they knew that the astronauts were flying them and that the astronauts were pretty valuable folks. So um, the folks that took care of our airplanes at Ellington Field were excellent. They didn't send us out flying an airplane that had anything wrong with it. The maintenance was very good in the, in the condition. Okay, so um, did did you get to fly the space shuttle as well? You mentioned that you'd like to go to space. Did talk about that some. Talk about uh, the training and talk about uh, whether you actually got to go to space. <laughs> well, you know, I was fortunate. Uh, you know, while we were wait waiting for flight assignments, we all had um, different things to do. And w one of them that I had to do was the... Um, shuttle avionics integration lab and where it was kind of a cockpit and um, they just were checking out all the wiring and things like that um, but they wanted us to sit and uh, pretend to fly the thing so they could look at all the uh, the hookups uh, with the computers and things like that and the black boxes it wasn't a really flying machine but I had a chance to to actually fly it um, they would tell me, you know, here's what we're going to do and, you know, basically line it up and, and things like that. And then we learned how to handle some of the malfunctions. So, you know, I knew I was probably never going to fly on the space shuttle, but it was excellent training uh, to understand what was going on so I could be of help uh, if I needed to. I wasn't ever going to fly the space shuttle, um, but I learned so much more from working in the simulators. 
Yes, and it was the Avionics Integration Laboratory. So it was integrating all of the sensors, the navigation systems, the inertial navigation systems, the rate gyros, the accelerometers, the all of the avionics, and using the actual wire links, the cable links, uh, that the SAIL Laboratory, Shuttle Avionics Integration Laboratory, right. was uh, was was putting all through its paces. Right. And uh, some, I think some of the better qualified astronauts that we had were the ones that actually worked in the SAIL Laboratory because right. right. uh, they got very, very familiar with the mainframe computers and, and all the systems of the orbiter. So that was valuable training. But to me who had never, when I got to NASA, had never worked a computer because they were not in healthcare at the time. You know, for me, understanding how the computers worked and how they might, might fail, um, that was quite an experience for me. I had a lot of learning to do. You got to fly on the space shuttle fly, as a crew member. I got to fly as, as a crew member. As on a my mission first specialist on the shuttle. Yes. So, so, well, tell us about that. Tell us about how you heard that uh, you, you had been selected, uh, what sort of a mission was it, uh, that sort of thing. Well, the director of flight crew operations, George Abbey, uh, was known to send a message over to the astronaut office, kind of, come see me. And everybody was waiting. We were kind of waiting in line um, to be assigned to a flight. And I got that call from Mr. Abbey, come on over and see me. And, of course, at the time, I had hoped that he had a flight assignment for me. And he did. He assigned me to STS-51D. And I asked him well, what was on that flight, because we didn't really know what was going to be manifest for all the flights. It was a couple of satellites. There were some... Um, some life sciences experiments on board uh, with things that I could do. It was a great crew. Um, it was interesting that they put a senator on board with us, Jake Garn, um, and he was going to do some, some um, studies on space motion sickness. So, you know, I could help him with those things. I had an echocardiograph that took... Uh, um, echo pictures of the human heart. So there were a few little things that were in my specialty field. Um, and of course, I could certainly um, help the pilots. I sat behind um, the pilot. You know, there was the commander on the left and the um, co-pilot or on the right, and I sat behind him. And, um, you know, I had certain things to do. Did NASA call that person the co-pilot? No. What did, what did NASA call that person who was in the right seat? Tell me. You're right, the pilot. The pilot. Right? The commander and the pilot. You're right. right. Now, was there, was there anything funny about commander and pilot? Was the pilot the pilot in command? Nope. The commander was in so command. So the commander was the... Com was the person was the, that flew it. Was the pilot in command. So the pilot was really... The co-pilot. That's true. Well, why, why didn't they call the pilot the co-pilot? Well, the guys all had big egos, and they didn't want to be called a <laughs> so, co -pilot. so NASA said, okay, you can be called the pilot, even though you're actually the co-pilot. That's right. You can go out and talk to all the pretty ladies and say, I was the pilot because, on the space Because shuttle. astronauts are such prima donnas, nobody's willing to be called co-pilot. Yeah, they were all men, prima donnas. <laughs> They were all men. Did we ever have any men pilots on the space shuttle? Surely not. Of course we did, but not while we were there. It was take, it took them a few years to get uh, women into the astronaut program, but later on uh, they did come in and they did a terrific job. I was really proud of them. 